Let's pray together as we start our service. Lord, thank you that we can come together to worship and to learn about worship. And learn some different aspects of worship and, and ways that we worship. Father, I pray that you would teach us and that you would humble us. That you would show us who you are. Father, we love you and we want to trust you. But God, sometimes it's hard when we're caught up in the circumstances of life. Help us to see through that and past that to how great and wonderful and faithful you are. And in the midst of whatever we're going through, to worship you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Alright, so we're in the third part of our Come to Worship series. We've talked about lifting up our hands in worship. We've talked about bringing our gifts in worship. Um, today, we're going to talk about something that maybe we don't maybe naturally think about as worship, but that I think is not just worship, but I think it can be a pretty powerful um, time of worship once we finally sort of get there, if that makes sense. You'll, I think you'll see here in a minute what I mean. Um, and that's this idea about pouring out our heart in worship, pouring out our soul in worship. I think it's a, an act of worship that connects us maybe as intimately with the heart of God as anything that we can do in worship. And yet it's a hard thing. I think it's hard for men. I think it's hard for everybody. I think it's particularly hard for men, maybe. Um, or at least it sort of seems that way to me. But um, as we get to the end of the service, I, I want to encourage you... Um, to do this. I want to encourage you to just pour out your heart. Maybe you're not in a place where you're in life or, uh, or season where this is as appropriate as maybe others. Some of you I know, like I know enough about what's going on in your life that this is this is probably kind of where you're at or certainly could, could be. Um, I know it's where I get from time to time. And so it's important. Um, we can pour out our heart to God. We can cry out to God and we can do that because He cares for us. We're going to look at a number of passages today. In fact, we'll spend almost as much time reading Scripture as we will talking about it. Maybe not quite, but it, it, there's a lot. I, in, my notes, I, in my notes, I print the text that I'm going to read and I try to highlight them. There's a lot of yellow in my notes today. And so uh, we're going to spend some time in God's Word and seeing how pouring out our hearts is an act of worship. Let's start in Psalm 142. Uh, Psalm 142. This is this is written by King David. And he was at a particularly low point in his life. And by the way, a number of the passages we're going to read today come from the Psalms. And when, when we think, at least in a cursory way, about the Psalms, and what do they what do they say and what do they sound like, we usually think happy things and encouraging things and you know praise and worship things. And that they those things are definitely there in the Psalms, right? We there's a number of Sundays we'll begin our service with like a, a video or, or reading from a psalm and it's, you know, rejoice in the Lord always or, or, you know, it's those kind of big and that stuff is for sure in there. And the Lord is my shepherd is so encouraging. But listen, a lot of the psalms, a lot of the psalms are, are hard, right? And they're difficult and they're angst and anger and hurt and passion and and so we're going to look at some of those today. In fact, if you just sort of work your way through the Psalms, it's shocking almost. Like if you were to go through and categorize, okay, this one talks about this, and this one talks about that, it's, it's kind of surprising how many take on a bit of a dark tone. And this is a little bit, a little bit of this in this, Psalm 142. King David is at a low point in life, and we're going to read the first five verses. David writes this, I cry aloud to the Lord, I lift up, my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before Him my complaint before I tell Him my trouble. That I pour out before Him my complaint before I tell Him my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. The, the world is out to get me. 
And it, and it was, in a sense, out to get him, right? It's, there's the old joke, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean they're not really out to get me, right? He's not being paranoid. People really were out to get him. Verse 4, look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. David, David says, I pour out my complaint. Right? I, I'm just going to put this all on you, God. All of it. I'm just going to pour it out there. My life is unbearable. This is hard. And he just cries out and tells God all his troubles. And then, at the end, he says, you are my refuge. Now, and we'll see this word refuge come up a time or two. The word refuge in the Old Testament is it's kind of a meaningful concept. Here's the concept. Now, it's used a variety of ways, but here's the concept in the word refuge. God's law had been given to his people. And it was pretty clear about a number of things, right? The law was all about... Um, if you do this, there's this reward. If you do this, there's this punishment, right? It was very, it was very, um, uh, con everything was consequence, right? Behavior consequence. If you kill somebody, your life will be taken. But there was an allowance if you killed somebody by accident. Now, people would still try to seek revenge, and justifiably so. But if you killed somebody by accident, there were a handful, I think there were six or seven cities in the country that were places of refuge. And you could go there and you would be protected. But only if it was an accident, right? I mean, it was... But there was refuge there. There was safety and there was security there. And you could live your life there. And it's not the same as living outside of that, having never committed this act. But having committed this act, this... this Injury this against a person in a family, right? You could still seek refuge if it was an accident. And and so I think when David writes, God, you are my refuge. In the midst of in the midst of the world hunting me down, in the midst of everything wrong, in the midst of my life being in danger, in the midst of no safety, and in the midst of whatever it is that I'm under, you are my refuge. It's a pretty pretty powerful description to say to God, God, you're my refuge, because of this idea of what refuge means. Now, the video, uh, the, the scripture passage that was supposed to be, the video that was supposed to be played, it was in Psalm 62, verse 5 through 8. Let's read that. Psalm 62. And the psalmist writes, Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from Him. Truly, He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to Him, for God is our refuge. David says in the Psalms again and again and again that God is our refuge. In fact, throughout the Psalms, whether written by David or not, the Psalms were largely written by David, not completely. Um, but throughout, the, throughout this collection of Psalms, the word refuge is used uh, about 45 times. That's a pretty prominent theme about God, and most of the time it's in the context of God being our refuge. You can call out to God. You can pour your heart out to God. You can do that because He is a safe place. Now, I know that there's this whole thing in our culture and media, and especially in the educational world about a safe place. That's not what I mean, right? This is a genuine, God is a genuine, honest to goodness, legitimate, safe place. He's our refuge. He loves it when we cry out to Him. He loves when we pour out our hearts to Him. He wants to hear from us. He loves it when we seek Him. He loves it when we need Him. And here's the thing. The tough stuff that we're going through, whether it's in our, 
you know, in a marriage with our kids or grandkids or at work or whatever it is, the tough stuff of life, the hardness, He can handle it. Like you can pour that out on Him because He can handle it. We're going to um, we're going to look for a few minutes at pouring out our hearts in worship, and and there's a couple of simple principles that I want us to remember as we do that. And the first of those is to remember God's faithfulness. Remember God's faithfulness. Now, so so I don't pick out the songs, right? And Kathy and I usually talk sometime in the last half of the week about what the, the theme of the sermon is, but not in high, well, not in specific, just kind of here's the text, here's the general idea, and you know, go figure it out. And so she picks out songs. We didn't even get that far this week, and she, she sent me this is what I'm going to sing, and Warner was home, and this is one that he plays, and they like it, and I'm like, great, let's sing it. And it was this, this forever faithful. Right? Remember God's faithfulness. She's been hard pressed to find a song that fits this idea any better. God's faithfulness in the past is what we need to remember. In fact, Psalm 42, uh, we're going to look at that here in just a second. Psalm 42. It was written by the sons of Korah. Now, a lot of times, whoever wrote the song, maybe it adds meaning to it, maybe it doesn't, right? You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I'm a sucker for song stories, right? I'll, I don't know. Some people don't care about that. I think it's more interesting than the song oftentimes. I enjoy the story behind a number of the hymns that we sing, right? And so a good one that fits today's is, is, the, is the story of Horatio Spafford, right? And, and it is well with my soul. And you may have heard the story, you may not have, where he he uh, was sent. He and his family were going to move to Europe for a season, uh, to Paris, I think, for a season. And he put them on a ship and headed them toward Europe. And he was coming just a short time later, wrapping up some business. And and um, there was uh, it was an iceberg or a, or a collision, something. The ship that his family was on went down, and. He gets on the ship headed that way, and he knows this, and he's broken and crushed. And as he gets to about that spot where the ship went down with his family, he pins the words to the song, It is well with my soul. In the midst of all of the turmoil in his life, and the assault on his family, and the whatever, right? The, the stuff that you go through when your world has been torn apart, he was remembering God's faithfulness and remembering who God is and could, in the midst of his pain, not just say in his heart, but pen the words, it is well with my soul, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. And, and you probably know the song. So when you read those lyrics or you sing that song and you hear that story, right, you think, oh, it's even more, right? I mean, it's, it's a strong lyric and then you hear why he wrote it and it's, even more so, right? Well, so the sons of Korah. You may not know who Korah was. There's a little snippet about Korah in the Old Testament. In um, Numbers chapter 16, we hear about a Levite named Korah who led a rebellion against Moses. And he died for this. We know from the story that he was killed. But here's what else we know. In spite of Korah's poor leadership example, his sons continued to serve God faithfully. They served in the, uh, they served in the temple or the tabernacle. They served as Levites. Now, I don't know if his sons wrote this psalm as they're reflecting on this tragedy of losing their father or not. But his sons wrote this psalm. And whichever one, and anyway, the Psalm 42, beginning of verse 1. Just, you know about Korah, listen to this. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul longs for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? 
My tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Have you ever felt like that? Like where you could say, my tears have been my food day and night. You know what that means? This means, this means I am in such a state that I can't eat and I can't sleep. My sadness, my brokenness owns me. Have you ever felt this way? Have you ever, whatever it was, right? The loss of a loved one, the, a, a rift in your relationship, a, a losing a job. I don't know what it is, right? But we all... One, one time or another, right, we get this, we undergo this pain and this hardness. My, my tears are my food. People ask, where's your God? And then you start asking, yeah, where, where is my God? Yeah. Are those people on to something? Right, do they... Why is this happening? But verse 4 in that is key. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. These things in the midst of my pain, these things I remember. And he talks about going to the house of God and he talks about worship. And he Now remember, he's not feeling these things. He's not feeling like going to church and he's not feeling like gathering with people. And he doesn't feel like worshiping and he doesn't feel the happiness that often comes with those things. Right? You see what I'm saying? He doesn't, he doesn't want those things. I mean he, he longs for them, but it's not like he's it's not like he's amped up for a big time of worship, right? He's but he's remembering them. He's thinking about them. Listen, feeling like worship is a good thing, right? Excitement, happiness, right? Those are good things. But more important is knowing and wanting based on knowledge and experience and an understanding of who God is and how much He loves us and how much He cares for us and that even when we don't feel like it, He still wants those things for us. And even when we don't feel like it, He's still there waiting on us. He says, these things I remember as I cry out to God. He says, put your hope in God. I will praise Him, my Savior and my God. So when we're crying out to God, we've got to remember His faithfulness in the past. right? We've, listen, we've experienced His faithfulness. And as we remember His faithfulness, we find encouragement. Because then we remember that, hey, I, I've been here before. <laughs> hey, he saw me through this another time. He is faithful. He was there when I was up. But the last time I was down, he was there too. And he'll bring me out of this again. When we, when we say this doesn't make sense and we don't understand, there's this prophet in the Old Testament, Jeremiah. He uh, became known as the weeping prophet. Right? He wrote a little book, carries his name, you might have heard of it, the book of Jeremiah. He wrote another book called the book of Lamentations. And it's just what it says it is. It's a book of lament. It's a book of sadness. And it is, right? If you're wanting a little pick-me-up, that's not the one. Right? It's not. It is the... It's tough to read. But in Lamentations 3, he, he does this. Right? He just pours out his heart. He spends 20 verses in Lamentations 3 just, just putting it out there. 
He just it just just pours it all right out on the table, right out for, before God. God can handle it. By the way, one of the reasons God can handle it is because He's such a I mean, He created us, He knows us, He's a big, He's a big God, an all powerful God. All of that's true, right? He can handle it. But the other reason He can handle it is because He knows it anyway, right? When you pour it out, it's not a surprise to Him. And so if you're wondering why God isn't doing what you want in whatever arena of life it is, you pour out your heart to God on these things and you don't understand, you just cry. That's what Jeremiah did. But then you get to Jeremiah 3, verse 19. And here's what, here's what Jeremiah writes. He says, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. It's not a word we use a lot anymore, is it? The gall. I remember, I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind. Right? It's in, there's intentionality there. And therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for Him. So in the middle of pouring out his heart before God, in the middle of his brokenness, he remembers, like he calls to mind. This isn't just, he didn't just stumble on, you know how sometimes you'll see or hear, or even honestly, for me, it's a smell, smells make me remember things. I know, that's, anyway. He didn't just stumble on a memory. Right? He didn't just... He made himself remember. He dug back in there. He called to mind. And he had hope. He's complaining to God. He's talking about God. He's talking to God. He says, great is your faithfulness, God. And just like that, sometimes we have to get lost in the presence of God as we cry out to Him. We have to think back and remember what He's brought us through. Think back to when you called on Him. Think back to when He forgave you. Think back to when God answered certain prayer. Think back Think back to when God met a need and nobody else could have met it. Right? It, didn't just, it wasn't just luck and it wasn't just circumstances fell together. Right? It had to be that God orchestrated this for you. Think back and remember God's faithfulness. That's the first thing we do is we pour out our hearts in worship. Remember God's faithfulness in the past. The other thing is to trust in God's great power. Remember His faithfulness and trust in His power. Remember His faithfulness and trust in His power. It's not a terribly hard, right? It's hard to do sometimes in the midst of whatever it is. It sounds so simple though, doesn't it? Remember His faithfulness, trust in His power. Psalm 102. The psalmist is in distress. Again, another psalm where the psalmist is at a low point. Right? There's a lot of that, I said. And as he pours out his heart to God, and maybe you, maybe you, we're going to read the first part of this psalm, and who knows, maybe something in there resonates with you, right? Maybe something in there you, you hear and say, oh, that's me, I could have written that. I said something kind of like that just yesterday, you know? Here's how the psalm starts. Hear my prayer, Lord. Let my cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me when I am in distress. Turn your ear to me when I call. Answer me quickly. For my days vanish like smoke. My bones burn like glowing embers. My heart is blighted and withered like grass. I forget to eat my food. In my distress I groan aloud and am reduced to skin and bones. So this is, listen, this is a physical affliction. It's emotional. It's spiritual. This is all encompassing. Verse 8, I am like a desert owl, like an owl among the ruins. I, I don't know much about owls. So I'm not sure how this fits in, but this sounds bad. A desert owl among the ruins. 
right? I don't want any part of this. This is how he feels right now. Seven, I lie awake. I have become like a bird alone on a roof. All day long my enemies taunt me. Those who rail against me use my name as a curse. For I eat ashes as my food and mingle my drink with tears because of your great wrath. For you have taken me up, thrown me aside. My days are like the evening shadow. I wither away like grass. That's heartbreaking. The loneliness, the pain, the brokenness. And from time to time, we all feel at least a little bit like this. Sometimes it's internal. You know, sometimes it's, it's woe is me. Sometimes it's life crashing in around us. Dealing with the mess in other people's lives brings us into that and down. But nonetheless, that's where we sit. And then, you get to verse 12. And he says these three words that absolutely change everything. And, and when I read this, as I was working on this, these three words, man, and, and I hope, I hope they mean even just a little bit to you. I hope they're what you need. So the psalmist has said, my life's falling apart. My body's falling apart. I don't understand. I cry out for help. I'm own, my enemies are taunting me. And then he says these three words, but you, Lord. But you, Lord. But you, Lord, sit enthroned forever. But you, Lord, your renown endures through all generations. And then down to verse 17. He will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. But you, Lord, After all of that pain and all of that hurt and all of that difficulty, and then I saw those three words on the front end of verse 12, and I said, wow. But you, Lord. I'm in the midst of this, but you, Lord. I am broken and hurt and confused, and life is crumbling, but you, Lord. Maybe you need to have a but you, Lord moment. And if you do, do it, right? Just decide to, right? This isn't, you don't need special inspiration or permission or anything else like that, right? If you see yourself in that first part, you need to see yourself in that, but you, Lord. Pour out your heart. Complain. Let it rip from the depths of your soul. Because you can cry out to God. He loves you and He wants to hear from you. I would say virtually all of us in this room have professed to trust in Christ as Savior. We profess to have confidence of this work that we believe He has done in us. We profess to have the Holy Spirit living and working in us and with us and through us. We profess all of these things and we do so correctly. And yet, somehow, we don't believe that God has the strength or the power to handle the things that we need to turn over to Him. We don't believe He can say, or that He can handle it when we say, But you, Lord. Now we say we believe that, right? We say we have confidence, but we hold on to that stuff. We carry these burdens around as if we're the only one who can do this. 
You know, I, I carry a backpack just about everywhere I go. It's it's back down in the chair now. Right? My computer stays in it and a variety of others, usually a book or two and a number of things in it, right? So, but listen, my backpack will only hold so much weight before the stitches start tearing apart. I, I, I know this because I've torn them, right? And it only has so many square, they measure them in either, in either liters or square inches, right? So you get, but it'll only hold so much capacity. And then it won't hold anymore. Um, you are like that. I don't know if you know that or not. You only have so much capacity. And so the burdens of life, whether it's your kids or grandkids or whether it's work or whether it's personal illness or the illness of others, whatever it is, right, you can, only, you can only take on your back so much of that. And then you start to break apart. And you start to come apart at the seams. And you start to just explode like my bag will if I try to zip way too much into it. And maybe this is for me as much as you, but we've got to do a better job at offloading that stuff by saying, but you, Lord, I've got all of this that I'm carrying and all of this weight and all this brokenness and all of this burden. And we usually stop there. Because we think we've got some kind of unlimited capacity. And we do not. We need to continue and say, but you, Lord, you sit in throne forever. You've got unlimited capacity. You created it all. You can handle this. I'm going to let you. He will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. So today, as you're crying out, as you pour out your heart to God, is as you push through the pain in your life or the, the difficulty you're in or whatever it is, push through to the point of praising God. And that's the third. Praise Him. Praise Him for who He is. You may not understand where you're at or what's going on. You may not like where you're at or what's going on. But you can still say, but you, Lord are still in charge. But you, Lord, can handle this. But you, Lord, can bring me through. But you, Lord, will help me see another day. But you, Lord, are working in all of this to bring about good to those who love you and are called according to your purpose. But you, Lord, will never leave me and will never forsake me. And so we push through to the point of praise. And we praise God for who He is. And it's hard because... Sometimes where we're at, the difficult times or the pain or whatever it is, sometimes where we're at is so deep and we're in such a hole that we can't just dig our way out. It's too dark. But we can push through and praise the Lord for, uh, for who He is. God's our provider. He's our healer. He's our comfort. And we can say that at the name of Jesus, uh, that the name of Jesus is above every name. And we can testify that God's not given us a spirit of fear. And we can cry out and we can pour out our heart to God. And at some point, because we are His children and because we know Him and because we love Him, at some point, you look up and you realize you're not pleading, you're praising. Like where you started, right? Where, where you started with the crying out, God, where are you? I can't, I can't even tell if you're here. Why, why has this happened? And you move on to but you, Lord, and then you look up and you realize I'm not really complaining anymore. I'm praising Him. And we do that because... He's faithful because we can have confidence in that. Pouring out our heart to God is, I think, an incredibly intimate and powerful form of worship. But listen, it's, it's part of prayer and it's part of our prayer life. But often our prayer life is very safe. 
I'll, I'll wrap up sort of with this thought. Our prayer life is often so safe. We, like we, we pray the same prayers. We use the same words. We've got our little... I do. I absolutely do. And you probably hear it Sunday after and you're like, oh, thank you. Guys. Sounds the same as it did last week. Was I, was I here last week? I can't tell because it's the same prayer again and again. I don't know. Right? I, I get it. <coughs> our prayers are often incredibly safe. And there's a place for that, right? I, I don't, not, I'm not beating that up. I mean, there's a place for that. But there's also, there's also a place in our prayer life for honesty. And for our prayers to reflect the things that we're feeling and thinking. Because our prayer life is supposed to be this intimate relationship with God. It's supposed to be this intimate time. And, and that ought to be the time where we can. You know, God, I'm sorry. I'm about to say some things. Right? That I, that I feel a little bit ashamed for saying and thinking. And then just pour it out. He can handle that. And He wants us to pray to Him. He wants to hear from us. Whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is you're crying out to God for, pouring out your heart. As we come together in worship, we're going we're gonna to sing one last song in worship. And, and uh, I would encourage you, pour out your heart to God. If you'd like to pray together at the end of our service, I, I would love that more than anything to spend time with you. If there's something you'd like to pray about, then, uh, then please come to me. Even as we sing, you can come to me. Let's pray together. Dear Father, help us to trust in you. Help us to remember your faithfulness. Help us to trust in your great power. Help us to praise you for who you are. Lord, as we go through the times of life that are hard, difficult, Lord, I pray that, that we would come to you, that we would pour out our hearts to you, that we would hold nothing back. together. You know our every thought, our every emotion. But you long for us to be in an intimate relationship with you. Help us to do that by pouring out our hearts to you. And Lord, even this morning, if there's somebody who or maybe is struggling, maybe in pain, Maybe going through a time of difficulty. Lord, I pray that they would, uh, even today, that your Holy Spirit would work in their heart. Help them to just pour it all out to you. We ask it all in Jesus' name.